Okay, uh, let's uh, move on to our last speaker of the session. I'm uh, really looking forward to this one. I think probably everyone is, uh, you, know, where we, you know, where we're at, you know, more from a business point of view, right? So we, uh, a lot of scientists in the room, but, uh, you know, where do we make the money? Um, so our last speaker of this session is uh, uh, James um, uh, Kushner. Yeah, he covers communications infrastructure for Loop uh, Capital Markets. Uh, uh, Mr. Kushner is, uh, has over 11 years of experience uh, covering uh, communications equipment, most recently as senior vice president of, uh, uh, with uh, Joffrey's LLC. Uh, in uh, in uh, 2013, Mr. K uh, Kushner uh, uh, was recognized uh, by investor, uh, uh, actually, institu institutional investor as a rising star in three communication categories and in 2014 was awarded the honorable mention for his work in telecom and network equipment. Previous to his experience on Wall Street, uh, uh, Mr. Kushner spent seven years as consumer manager with uh, uh, Contagra uh, Foods, Kellogg Company, and Procter and & Gamble. He holds, he holds an MBA from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania and a BA in e economics, math, uh, mathematics, and political science from Indiana University. Let's welcome him. Thank you. So let me make it very clear. My last name is Kistner, not Kushner. I'm not related to Jared. <laughs> very important, very important. Um, um, so as he alluded to, um, you know, I have a pretty different perspective, I think, from most people in this room. I know you guys kind of work on the trees. I kind of look at the forest and the green leaves on those trees. Um, so, um, you know, this is my sixth appearance back here at MIT. I really appreciate being here. Um, the title of my talk, um, you can barely see it there, is Silicon Photonics, uh, Bell of the Ball. And um, you know, basically the point here is that Silicon Photonics technology is really starting to show a lot of promise in the marketplace, a lot of commercial traction. I think it's, it's pretty much undeniable at this point. And you know, the future, what, what the future holds remains to be seen, but uh, there's been some pretty good data points coming out of OFC. Um, so briefly here, what I'm going to talk about here, I, I like to, just for the people that are new here, or people who have really bad memories, just kind of go over what I do for a living very briefly. Um, then I like to go through, do our, my little annual trip down memory lane, just kind of the key milestones in the industry, how it's developed, and what's happened in the last year since, since I came. Um, then I kind of give my financial markets update, show some stock charts, it's uh, pretty fun. Um, then I'm going to dive into a little bit more into how Silicon Photonics itself is doing from my perspective. All right, so and again, I know we've got some repeat participants, so I won't belabor this, but um, like I said, I, I'm actually what's called a sell set analyst. I work in an investment bank. Um, I don't actually invest money, it's my clients who invest money, hedge funds, mutual funds, billions, trillions of dollars. Um, I take, uh, cover our universe of stocks, I'm actually pretty focused on communications infrastructure in my new role. I had a little bit, little bit more hardware in my last role, but I cover six optical communications, or components companies, um, Applied Electronics, 26, Lamentimo, Quero, Acacia, Finisar. Um, you know, basically, uh, you know, uh, it'd be pretty difficult, I think, five years ago to say that you covered six optical component companies. So that by itself tells you something, that something's sort of been happening in the optical component space. Um, the company I work for is called Loop Capital. We're an investment bank based in Chicago, um, an institutional brokerage founded in 97. Um, we've been focused on fixed income, but we've been aggressively moving into equities. We actually have 12 publishing analysts, including three other analysts besides myself in tech. Um, we're also the exclusive partner of Bank of China in the U.S., so that's kind of a feather in our cap. Um, and by the way, feel free, anybody wants to talk to me during a break and exchange a business card, I'd love to get to know about your company and just and talk about our, our company as well, if you like. Um, so again, briefly, this is what's called a comp table. It's a tool of my trade. It shows a lot of companies in my universe. And basically, um, there's a lot of metrics on here that kind of handicap what investors think about the, the future prospects of companies. So like if you look at this, this column here called P slash she, some of you may invest and look at Yahoo Finance. That's price earnings multiple. Higher generally means higher growth prospects, higher expectations. Um, but uh, you know, basically, uh, I'd point out here that I have buy ratings on 2.6, um, Momentum, and Silicon Photonics, Player Acacia right now. But I also have hold ratings on Finisar and Applied Electronics. Um, they're very hooks on Datacom. I'll explain more about that later. Um, so again, just uh, the trip down memory lane. Um, I thought it was kind of fun to kind of put the titles of my notes. I think it's kind of to some degree highlights my view of silicon photonics technology, but also kind of investors' view. And I think that the, the technology's had a bit of a hype cycle, just like any other. Um, you know, you can see here, uh, you know, we talk about the hype cycle in 2014, and, you know, 2017 we had fun with Party, like it's 1999. Optical stocks were doing very well at that time. And you know, here again we have 
silicon photonics, the bell of the ball, which we'll again get to in more detail. Um, so I won't spend too much time on these, but you know, a little history lesson. I think everyone kind of knows this. I think that the industry and Wall Street kind of really woke up to uh, silicon photonics technology, I'd say in February 2012. You know, Cisco came out and bought a company called Lightwire for 300 million with no revenue. Um, Cisco does something like that, it kind of freaks people out, including myself included. Um, within a year, Intel announced they were gonna sample uh, uh, engineering samples of silicon photonics modules, and Intel was demoing, and it just seemed like, wow, this is really gonna take off right now. Um, so I got excited, um, a lot of people got excited. Um, if you look at 2014, um, technology seemed to be kind of marching on. Um, Mellanox uh, announced the acquisition of Katura. Um, you had Intel saying they were sampling stuff. Um, you know, Acacia announced products. Scorpio put up press releases. IBM talked about a fully qualified foundry service in 15, so it seemed to be really marching on. Um, if you look at, um, you know, what happened here um, in, in 2000, by the time I had presented in 2015, it seemed like um, the industry took a bit of a breather. Um, you had uh, Intel delay you know, by basically a year, their commercialization of silicon photonics, they changed leadership. I think you a lot of people here know Alexis. Um, wouldn't say there was no progress. You had some people, you know, Rockley did announced uh, some investments, and JDT talked about launching products in silicon photonics. Mellanox talked about, um, they actually launched products there, so it wasn't, wasn't all bad, but things kind of slowed down. Um, and if you go into 2016, um, there were further acquisitions, you had um, Sienna bought Teraxion, silicon photonics player. Um, you had Juniper by Orion, so you know, still, still some interesting, just general, a lot of acquisition activity was, was happening. Microsoft Infi announced PAM4, um, silicon photonics based QSP28 for, for data center interconnect. Um, Kiam was announcing products that were using Luxterius technology, so things were happening. Um, but by the time uh, um, 2017, ah, 2017 came around, we were anticipating 100 gig. Um, the big thing in 2017 was just, there's a ton of, of access to capital markets. You had a lot of people raising money. You had Acacia doing um, a big secondary offering that raised over $100 million. Eau Claro raised $144 million. Um, Finisar raised you know, over half a billion in debt. Um, and I think that, that one maxim would be, you know, in, in the investing world is that, you know, when people are accessing capital markets, that's sometimes the sign of a market top. Unfortunately, I think you'll see that kind of um, proved to be the case. Um, so as we get to the last year here, um, I'd say things have been heating up on the, on the silicon photonics front. Um, you had major CMOS player Global Foundries uh, make some announcements on its um, silicon photonics capabilities and goals. Rockley has been getting money from, from university and from a Chinese company. Molex made investments in silicon photonics um, after its Luxterra ended some time ago. Juniper is, is, is commercializing QSP28 transceivers using the Orient technology. Um, Finisar announced a new CEO. I think you make an argument that's partially due to the pain that, that they've seen from silicon photonics and Datacom. Um, Eau Claro said they were going to stop doing QSP28 CWM4 modules, so they just couldn't take the heat anymore, just too much pricing pressure. Um, I think another really um, important point that on this slide, it's sort of a seminal event here, um, is China's announcement late last year. Um, I guess they don't have a pointer on here, but late last year they said, hey, we're gonna start making um, Apple components onshore and, and really foster a, a local industry. So um, I think that's no small port due to the export ban on ZTE in 2016. It's kind of a defensive move, and obviously Trump and China have been in the headlines quite a bit um, last week. Um, so on to something fun that I really like to do, which is just take a look back at, at the Apple component stocks and how they've been doing over kind of multiple windows of time um, and give you some view of the drivers that we're, we're thinking about on Wall Street. So the 10-year view never looks pretty. I'm not gonna change this year. I don't mean to pick on Finisar and Oclero, but they're the only two companies that really have a history going back that far. Um, in the past, I presented a 10-year view. It's always been well below where the NASDAQ was. That hasn't changed. Um, I think what that comes down to is historically, this space, um, basically there's a lot of standardization, high technical requirements, but you know, the products are substitutable, and you've got not a lot of revenue growth from the carrier side, so a lot of pressure um, on cost. And so it's not really been, and on the enterprise side for that matter as well, um, but uh, you know, this is relative to the NASDAQ, so it actually isn't the absolute stock price. It's you know, comparing the, the delta between them and, and the tech index. So you know, ideally, you want to outperform the broader market, and these guys have not. Um, so looking at the, uh, the, the five-year view, 
Things are a bit better. Um, Aquero has surged from near bankruptcy to more than tripling in value. Um, also, they sold themselves um, to, uh, to Lumentum recently. Um, Applied Electronics on the right, that's AOI, has been on a roller coaster. That's the blue line that's gone up and way down, but they're still technically up over five years, um, almost 40% versus the NASDAQ. Again, Finisar and NEO um, at the bottom there, they, they've underperformed by around 40 to 50%. It's kind of interesting because they're both in very different markets. Finisar's in Datacom, and Neo is more in Telecom with a big China exposure. So it's kind of interesting they're both kind of on the bottom here. Um, I think the three of you looks a bit better, and I've actually added some stocks here because you've had some companies go public like Acacia, and I put two six on the three of you because I feel like that's probably the most clean time to look at them as more of an optics company. They, they've kind of done some acquisitions over time um, to get in the space. Um, you know, Eclair and Lamentum really stick out. Um, I think it's important to note those both, both those guys have good exposure to telecom, optical components, and Verizon's Metro build out. Um, you know, however, from where we sit, 3D sensing is what really is driving the, the upside for Lamentum and the outperformance. Um, you know, so uh, 26 has also done pretty well, 36% above um, the uh, NASDAQ. They're also exposed to 3D sensing and, um, you know, applied electronics still outperforming um, despite the roller poster. Um, but our poor uh, Silicon Photonics IPO, Acacia, is, is, is underperformed by about, about 10%. Um, and again, Neo and Finis are bringing up the rear. And the final here is the, uh, the one-year view. This is kind of a pitiful chart. Um, you know, really, the uh, optical component industry just, just hasn't done as well as the broader technology industry. And, and part of that's due to like the fangs, like Facebook and Amazon, all those guys you know, running up. Um, but it's also because China bought way more in 16 than, than they were going to consume in 16. And, and we'll, we'll see more about that. I mean, also because data center competition got really, really tough. And we'll talk about perhaps why in a second. So this is the slide I presented last year. And I'll admit to being a little more uh, positive than I should have been last year. Um, you know, at the time, it seemed like China's build out of, net, of networks, uh, their optical backbone, Verizon's Metro 100 gig build, hyperscale data center builds, um, even 3D sensing. Those were all lasting trends. You know, we got a really bullish quote from Greg Doherty, the CEO of Aclero, um, basically comparing this time period to the bubble and saying, hey, you know, this is not only like the bubble where it was one industry driver, it was several, and they were lasting. And so the thought was this could be really, you know, really great for the industry. And so the, the question is, what happened? Um, so one thing is China happened. China, uh, I have a couple companies on here that have a lot of, of uh, China exposure. Um, Oquero, you know, they went to year-over-year -year declines in China in the, in the last few quarters of the year. You can see the Acacia quarterly sales to ZTE just totally plummeted. Um, so, uh, I mean, I'd say longer term, I'm still pretty bullish that China still has to build other metro networks, 5G is a big catalyst, but clearly they bought too much in 2016 at ZTE and others in Huawei, and part of it I think was defensive because after the ban at ZTE, people thought, wow, we might get cut off again, so let's, let's just, let's stock up. Um, again, also I mentioned earlier, um, China is publicly proclaimed as part of their five-year plan in December, we're going to start making optical components on shore, um, not the best news for the industry. Um, you know, as we look at what people are, you know, we ask people on earnings calls, on these investor calls, when these guys publish earnings, pretty much the answer from all management teams at this point is, hey, we're not worried about this, this is really hard stuff, good luck. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, to me, it's a little bit sanguine. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's kind of scary because, you know, these guys just spent, you know, China spent $30 billion building a NAND fab earlier this year. The whole optical component industry is $10 billion, so you'd think they could probably figure that out. And, you know, over time, perhaps 30% of the market, which is actually growing faster than the rest of the market, you know, China purchases of optical components actually could kind of disappear for vendors. So, um, not the best news. Um, Hyperscale CapEx continues to rise in importance. Um, that was still true. Uh, CapEx last year, you know, as on an as reported basis, and again, this is mostly on data center equipment, grew 28% to $40 billion almost, $39 billion in 2017. Um, expected to go under 30 percent. These are really big numbers. I mean, global capex for carriers is about 150. So I mean, and it's growing like one percent. So you know, this is still really important. And in Q4 alone, capex grew 50 percent. Um, you'd never know that from seeing the reports of public companies. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and I guess I'll just you know point to here. Um, you know, we did see you know a pretty big ramp in in transceivers. 100 gig Ethernet transceivers, and that's driven by hyperscale last year. You can see that the blue line is CWM4, and the, the green line is PSM4, and it's still expected to continue. So that, that hasn't really changed as an industry driver. Um, so talking, another big piece here, data center interconnect. These guys still have to spend a lot of money to connect data centers. 
Um, you can see here on the slide here in 2017, almost $4 billion, going to $6 billion by 2021, um, or like six and a half billion, almost seven billion by 2021. Um, so data center connect is still a big industry driver, and again, mostly driven by hyperscale. Um, Verizon Metro happening, took longer than people thought it would. Um, people I talk to say they're about a thousand nodes into a multi-thousand node deployment, so it's, it's very significant, still happening. You've got pretty strong outlook from both Eau Claire and on, on uh, their CP2 ACO modules. Um, Acacia's talking about Metro Sprint this year, um, and the Rotom business at, at Tidalomentum is taking off, so that's happening. Um, and again, 3D sensing, this has just been an, a boon for the industry, just, just insane. I mean, $200 million in revenue from like basically zero last year, and these are light sources for the iPhone 10 that are driving most of that. Momentum's primary primary source, 2.6 Infinistar are trying to join the party late, but you know, basically, uh, I mean, Momentum was at OFC talking about these coming to the back of the phone, and you know, it's, it's also, it's pretty interesting because it enables ultimately applications like augmented reality in your phone. And I think that's gonna be a really big bandwidth driver for the industry, and I think everyone here kind of cares about that. But what's also interesting is that's what, this business is what drove the strength of Momentum stock that allowed them to have the currency in the form of their stock to go buy Eau Claro. So it helped drive industry consolidation. It was actually a trigger. Um, so final point here on kind of the stock charts and just, this is the next 12 month price to earnings multiple um, for the five key companies excluding Eau Claro, excluding Eau Claro because they're not really valued um, in the same way since, they, since they're being bought. But um, these are kind of like, what are investors expecting? And, and so the top line here is Acacia. Um, they're a big outlier. Their price earnings multiple is you know, the next 12 months is over 35, and I think that basically is telling you there people are anticipating that you know, there's gonna be a bounce in earnings, big bounce in the business, so you know, they're exposed to Metro and Data Center Interconnect in China, so um, that, that's, that's one perspective. Um, the next three, Finisar, Acacia, and Light are those middle three, and they're kind of in this sort of same range, and you know, those guys are, um, Finisar, Light, and 2.6 are all exposed to 3D sensing. Um, but um, you know, historically, these are not wildly out of whack, um, in terms of their, uh, their, their price earnings multiple. But, but the one that's interesting too here is Applied Electronics, um, they're at the bottom. They're uh, close to 10 times next 12 month earnings, below everybody else. One thing that's not on here is that 65% of the shares outstanding for Applied Electronics are short. So investors are saying vehemently, we think the stock's gonna go down. And that is relevant to, the, to you guys and Silicon Photonics because you know, they're very directly exposed to, to hyperscale data centers and are the most directly exposed. So um, we'll talk more about that. So again, to get to the point here, Silicon Photonics, bell of the ball, why is it called that? Um, so with that OFC this year, there's this event called the Executive Forum that occurs on the Monday prior um, to the beginning of OFC and it's a bunch of management teams um, from a lot of pretty impactful companies and Microsoft presented and they threw this slide up, um, which we've recreated. And they've said, hey, um, we're not religious about technology, but Silicon Photonics is self-selecting for our needs. And if you go through link by link here, they did this live poll in February of you know, the technologies by link, and they're saying, hey, if you look at you know, DWM PM4, 100% Silicon Photonics, that's InFi. PSM4, 75% Silicon Photonics, I believe that's Luxterra and Intel. CWM4, 50% um, plus of their links are Silicon Photonics based. Um, and so it, they basically have, it's, it's dominating. And they're even saying, if you look at their long haul sub C kind of longer links, if you sort of separate out the DCI boxes that they bought in the past from traditional vendors like Sienna and Adva and Corient, 41% um, of their long haul and sub C links are, are uh, silicon photonics, which we think is pretty much all Acacia. Um, and they're also saying, hey, like we're not seeing any real performance difference. These legacy vendors will tell you that the performance is, is better for their products and we're not seeing a difference. Um, so pretty ringing endorsement from you know a pretty major company, um, and so you know one question I might have is like if you look at like Finisar and Applied Electronics, we've been talking about them underperforming and having low PE multiples. You've kind of seen some really interesting business results. You've seen you know Finisar is 80% Datacom, and that's where a lot of the action is in Silicon Photonics, uh, as we've seen. And gross margins at that orange line have fallen um, basically a thousand basis points or ten full points from about 37% to 27% in about a year. That's a pretty dramatic change, um, especially considering that their, and the revenue hasn't changed that much. Um, you can see that they're, and they're actually, you know, have a lot of revenue in q 28. It's been growing. Um, data comes from kind of flattish, but that's a pretty stark result in gross margin to see that. And they're saying, hey, there's just more competitors coming online. And they're not saying it's any big technological difference. 
that's causing it. Um, if you look at applied electronics, it's a different story, but also a lot of pain. Um, the revenue, the blue bars are going straight down. They've held, the margins have gone down only 500 basis points or so, um, but you know they're losing a lot of share. And when at a time when Hyperscale CapEx is up 50% year over year and volumes are ramping, their revenues are coming down. And they're saying, hey, this is just a pause caused by this transition to 100 gig. It's nothing to see here technology-wise. It's totally just 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 a pause. It's, it's cyclical. Um, interesting too, like counting lower their forecast for. Ethernet transceivers driven by more than expected pricing erosion. Um, and so one question is, what, is this what's happening here? This is you know, the chart here. This is what uh, Cisco is presenting, which is this is the promise of silicon photonics. You've got you know, basically today's traditional optics don't scale with Moore's law. You know, silicon photonics will scale, you know, scale with Moore's law when we get the infrastructure up and running. And one question might be is, is that's what's happening to these guys now? I mean, you've had a lot of adoption of silicon photonics, um, seen a lot of pain. From, from other uh, vendors, so you know what's happening. Um, but I'd point out here, you know, it's not just silicon photonics that's happening. You've, I mean, this is a, there's a lot of people that are supplying 100 gig Ethernet transceivers. I mean, this isn't even everybody. Um, I put in red the guys that are silicon photonics, but um, you know, there are certainly more guys on here that I, that I haven't mentioned. Um, but you've got basically at least I think I've got nine or ten here, um, and they're all selling interchangeable products. So. What happens when you're all selling the same product? Basically, um, you know, you end up having um, gross margin and revenue pressure. So it may or may not be technology. It may just be there's a bunch of guys fighting for the same business. Um, and there's also some really important points here. I mean, when I was at OFC, just talking to a lot of people, people, and I think Intel was going to present. I don't know if they're here. They can defend themselves if they want to. But um, people are saying Intel's not making money. That they're in this to drive sales of CPUs, or you know drive publicity, or you know, or maybe they're thinking it down the road, but they're really just, they're not, the, the economics are not driving their pricing, is what people are saying. And some people are saying that, you know, they're not long for this world in optics. Um, one big question is, does it get better at 400 gig? Does the field narrow? Does this, is this a temporary condition of the industry? Um, people talk about EMLs being necessary to do 400 gig, and, um, you know, DR and FR, and, you know, is, you know, who really has them, and, and will that be, capacity for that be a gating factor? Um, which is an outstanding question. Um, one thing that's really not helping the industry, had a complete fragmentation of business models in the last few years. Um, you know, Broadcom, formerly Avago, said, hey, you know, we're, we're done. We're not doing transceivers. Foxconn, you can have that business. We're going to just sell engines. That's where the money is. Um, they can do that. It's only 10% of their business. Um, if you're finished, not so easy. Infi got in the transceiver business. They're vertically integrated in ICs. Oclero said, we're done selling Q28. Transceivers. We're going to sell lasers only. Look, Sarah, they're selling engines and picks um, indirectly to hyperscale players, allegedly. Maycom, you know, there's been a lot of talk about them selling um, their LPIC um, to Amazon and having a package at, Finis at uh, Fabernet. Um, and Acacia, of course, is selling modules, chips, and optical picks. I may even add to this, Sienna's selling you know, their, their coherent technology to other people. I mean, it's basically, it's a tough time if you're really invested um, in big packaging infrastructure like Finisar, say, or applied electronics, you don't have the option to kind of do an end run and just sell semiconductors because your whole business model is built on a revenue line that includes getting paid for packaging. So this is not helping. <laughs> um, you know, I guess another point here is um, this was a CWM4 on there if I got a typo, but um, you know, one thing that's happening here too is performance requirements are going up and also power consumption is going up. Broadcom presented this at the executive forum. Um, they're concerned here. They're, they're, by their calculations, you're going to see um, the optical power on switches go up from 200 watts to 1,000 watts over time, and um, that's that's pretty difficult. Um, and you know, one solution um, that both Arista and Microsoft are talking about uh, is co-packaging optics. Um, I believe actually um, um, you're going to start to Arista. I believe I have a typo here. I think this is by 2021 when the series goes to 100 gig. Uh, that you're going to have to go package optics. And they're proposing this inter interposer connector. I think the industry needs to work on that right now. But um, you know, I think it creates a pretty interesting opportunity because it kind of just disrupts the ecosystem. It gives people an opportunity to, it's kind of a jump ball. Um, you can start working with OEMs and, and try to get in there. I've actually talked to some, some vendors in this space that are, that, are, that are working on this with OEMs right now. Um, so you know, pretty interesting discontinuity in the space to go from packaged optics to, or I should say, transceiver optics to co-package optics. Um, you know, no doubt, um, you know, in this industry, we're seeing optics take share from copper over time. Um, this is a pretty bullish forecast here from, from light counting, just as 
And you know, we're just seeing you know, optics take more and more lengths over shorter and shorter distances. And I would think that, I think the argument makes sense that as you go from box to box to board to board to you know, um, chip to chip, you're gonna, number of lengths is gonna expand dramatically and that should favor um, seamless based manufacturing. That's where semiconductors have shown. Shined, I guess that's the right participle. Um, but here's a, uh, you know, a pretty bullish forecast from your research. I, I believe that Jean-Louis Melange from uh, Keturah and Corn Apple Components was involved in those forecasts. And you know, they're saying, hey, like, look, you know, silicon photonics we think is really gonna take off here. It's gonna go from half a billion dollars in 17 all the way to three and a half billion plus in 2025 and along the way, two billion in 2023, a billion in 2020, and you know, that's a doubling over three years. So pretty, that could be a pretty healthy industry at, 50% plus gross margin. So this is right. Um, should be pretty exciting for a lot of people in this room. Um, but it's, so it was case closed. I, I think if you ask some people in the industry, they'll say, hey, like, no case isn't closed. Um, Alan Loeb, um, on, their, on the call where they you know, talked about their Eau Claire acquisition, said, you know, we looked at silicon photonics and we decided the Indian phosphide was a better bet longer term. And, and again, they're more focused on telecom, but um, they're saying, hey, we don't need this and we'd rather just double down and buy Eau Claire. Um, applied electronics, this is what we call book talking in my industry, probably is that they're saying, hey, you know, we're not even willing to admit that, that silicon photonics is gonna be, is the best technology for 100 gig. So, you know, I guess they're, I was just pointing out here, there are people out there that don't believe in what people in this room are doing. Um, it's a, uh, you know, reasonably, reasonably people can differ. Um, but um, you know, at the end of the day, um, I think it's undeniable. Silicon photonics is definitely gaining ground commercially. Um, you know, we still expect hyperscale data center growth to be, you know, off the charts, and those guys are very willing to adopt new technologies and innovative new guys. Um, business models for optical components seem to be evolving. Again, I think this is an opening for folks. Um, don't have to be the transceiver maker. Um, again, also, the integration of optics and, C and CPUs and ASICs is inevitable, I think, but again, creates opportunities for innovative solutions. I think the ramp of a 400 gig, um, in the datacom industry is, is, is potentially, you know, the timing is questionable, could be gated by laser availability, which we saw in 100 gig. Also, by the way, it took a lot longer than people thought. And just one final point to circle back on here, I do think you're probably gonna see more consolidation in the optical component industry. It's just, I think it's just natural when you're, when you're kind of in pain and you wanna figure out pricing power and, and scale, um, you know, the, the playbook is consolidate. Um, so we may see some more. Um, all right, so, um, I think that's my last slide. So keeping in mind, I'm not an engineer, uh, and now we're getting close to break time. Um, you know, happy to answer any questions or even hear some comments um, on any of this. Great, let's think. Okay, uh, open for a question or two? Not all at once. Wait, let's we have a break. <laughs> explain what the dynamics are going to be between the independent transceiver manufacturers and the integrated companies like Intel that have the capability to basically do everything. So you're talking about say the first category you said. Um, Dennis Starr and all those companies that are making transceivers, the direction of the industry is probably going to go closer and closer to the producers of the CPU itself. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think they're just in a tough spot. I mean, at the end of the day, at, the, at some point, they're gonna have to go to where the business is and rethink about their business models. I mean, you have this new CEO from the semiconductor industry, Michael Hurlson, from the Broadcom business, wireless business. And so, at Avago, they're used to thinking about new business models, and they're, I just don't think it's just a very tough road to hoe. Like, I just don't know what you do. I mean, I think at the end of the day, maybe there's a point where, you know, perhaps they can work on optical engines, and they can try to get, you know, do these co-package optics, and they can forego some of the revenue they would have Normally, had if they were selling a whole transceiver, if the volumes go up high enough, I mean, they're vertically integrated, um, you know, in lasers, they're still working on EML, they don't really have an EML, but, um, and obviously they're full of PhDs and they have a lot of intelligent people and even have some silicon photonics projects working at various times. So, I mean, I wouldn't count them out completely, but I do think it's pretty hard because they really are, their revenue model is really tied to these, this transceiver model, and you're seeing tremendous fragmentation and. Um, and some of the advantages they had as a vertically integrated player in the past no longer are gonna be advantages. So, um, you know, certainly I think uh, it, it's, it's gonna be difficult. I don't have all the answers. I mean, um, you know, maybe some guy from McKinsey can help them out. But I think they're, they're in a tough spot.
one other question is uh, the data centers that are out there already. Yeah. Um, there's not that many companies that are doing this. They're the big companies. You mm. listed them up there. Um, do you think that there's potential for a change from copper to optics, given the fact that all these data centers are already out there? Well, I mean, a change from copper to optics where on the, in the board or on between the server to the top of the rack? Or? In the system of the cell. Oh, absolutely. I mean, those designs are being worked on right now. I mean, I think it's like, that's Intel's bet. I mean, I think that's, that was Cisco's bet when they bought LightWare. I think everybody kind of knows that there's a point, you know, it's the resistive physics of copper that we're going to hit a wall here at some point. I mean, Andy Bettelstrom was very clear, like, when you do 100 gig, there's just way too much power on the Serdes. You, you just can't do it in copper anymore. You cannot. It's over. So I, th I think it's all going optics, or it's just a matter of time, but you have to get the price points down. At the end of the day, you, like, it's not going to be economically, you've you got to get out of copper economics at some point, which is what I think we're all here for. Okay, I think with that, just to stay roughly on schedule, we can certainly uh, uh, ask more questions during the break, but let's, uh, let's thank all the speakers of the session again.